All right, in this video, we are talking about hardware. I'm going to give a very brief review of some of the concepts that we talked about in Computer Fundamentals, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And then I'm going to go into some additional aspects of hardware that we didn't really cover in that video. So let's get on with it. The book defines hardware as the physical electronic components that input, process, output, and store data. And I want to focus on the physicality of this. When you have a computer, hardware is the stuff that you can actually touch. It's the circuit boards, it's the actual components that are on those circuit boards. Uh, this is as opposed to software, which we cover in the next video. Software is just electronic data. And over this video and the software video, we're going to talk a little bit about that electronic data concept, but essentially hardware is electronic components. They are passing in electrical signals to each other. They're processing things based on those electrical signals. Uh, that is essentially what hardware does. Now, some of the major hardware components that I identified in computer fundamentals was the CPU, which is essentially the brain. The CPU takes in certain instructions. Those instructions are provided by software, by the way, but it takes in instructions and decides how data needs to be processed in order to carry out the instructions that it was given. So it's actually the big decision-making part of the actual computer. Now, I want to clarify that the CPU isn't smart in any way. It's just automatically taking in certain instructions and performing those instructions, but we've just gotten really good at forming those instructions in such a way that the CPU can do things that appear to be very smart. That being said, a computer is very literal. It will do exactly what you tell it to do, um, but it's through the creation of really good software that we make software that is allows the user to, you know, not have to have a definite idea of exactly what they're telling the CPU to do. You don't need to have any knowledge of how the CPU works in order to create a document on Microsoft Word, and that's because we've gotten really good at making our programs extremely user-friendly. But at the end of everything, the CPU is the thing that is interpreting instructions and performing calculations and making decisions based on those calculations. Main memory holds the programs and data that the CPU is currently working with. Um, we consider main memory to be volatile because as soon as you turn off your computer, main memory gets erased. And that's actually why you have to save your Word documents or Excel spreadsheets or stuff like that. Because when you open up a Word document and start to make changes, uh, it actually is computationally very expensive to constantly write those changes to the hard drive, especially if then you decide, oh wait, I don't want these changes anyway, and then you want to undo it, then you have to undo those changes, which means writing more data to the hard drive. It takes a very long time. So all of your changes are stored in main memory until you decide to save your document. You either hit control S or you click the floppy disk save icon at the very top of Microsoft Word or Excel. And at that point, all the changes in memory are actually written to your storage. And it ends up being a lot more efficient. Sometimes, you know, we forget to save and we lose all of our changes, but we do want to keep our changes in main memory until we actually know that we want to save those, those changes, and then that's when we write everything to disk. Now, the most common type of main memory is going to be RAM, what's known as random access memory. What that means is that you have all of this space where you can store data, you can store programs, all that kind of stuff, but you can access any piece of that data at any point. This would be as opposed to if you use tapes as your main memory, which is what people used to do a lot of the time, you would actually have to go through the tape linearly, you know, segment by segment by segment, until you find the piece that you want to work with. You don't have to do that with RAM. You don't have to search through everything li uh, linearly, segment by segment by segment, until you find the piece of data that you're looking for. You can just 
write that data to a particular place in main memory and then access it uh, as fast as you could access it about anywhere else in RAM. Sort of, uh, it gets a little bit complicated, but you, uh, you'll be working with RAM in modern computers nowadays. We have, we've uh, gone past the point where we need to use tape or something else that's pretty archaic for our main memory. Storage hardware is what stores your data long term even when you turn your computer off. Storage hardware is the reason why you can access your documents after you've turned your computer off and then turned it back on again because it's able to keep your documents safe for a long time. Unfortunately, not forever. There's always some amount of entropy as storage hardware ages, but uh, you do have documents long term if you put them on actual storage hardware. This is also known as secondary storage, by the way. Types of secondary storage include the HDD, the hard disk drive. Uh, this has been very popular for a very long time. It is spinning magnetic disks that we electronically encode data onto by changing the magnetic field on certain points of that disk. And what we're able to do is actually, uh, as time goes on and technology improves, the uh, size of the mag magnetic field that we can change, you know, the minimum size grows smaller so we can fit more and more data onto those really small disks. That minimum size essentially refers to the fact that if you have a magnetic field that's too small, then it might kind of get confused with another magnetic field and things might get weird. The computer might not be able to detect it, all that kind of stuff. But as technology improves, we can make our magnetic fields that store that data smaller, which means that we can store more data on the same size of disk. The other big type of uh, secondary storage is the SSD, where instead of encoding data onto magnetic disks, we are actually able to now encode data on non-volatile memory chips. So memory chips that work a little bit like the stuff in main memory, except for the fact that they don't get erased when they're no longer being powered by the computer, which was a huge, huge discovery that you know this is something that's actually possible because now it means we don't have to futz around with uh, magnetic disks anymore. We can actually just put data straight onto uh, memory chips pretty much in the same format that we use data inside of an actual computer. We don't have to convert it to magnetic fields or convert magnetic fields back to data. We can just put data onto those chips the same way we would do it in RAM. In, in main memory or something like that. So the SSD is a really, really cool development. And you'll see a lot of different types of SSDs out there, especially if you're trying to buy a computer. If you're looking at uh, laptops or desktops, you might see uh, NVMe, PCIe, SATA 2, SATA 3, all that kind of stuff. Um, really, all of that just refers to the way that the SSD connects to the computer. Uh, Internally, it's all kind of the same, where it just uses non-volatile memory chips in order to store your data. They're really cool. Um, they do have the tendency of burning out because there's only so many times you can write to a certain chip before you can't really write to it anymore. I believe with the new chips, you can theoretically still read from those sectors but you can't change them after a certain point. So making sure that your SSD is healthy is really important that, you know, making sure that you're still able to write to all of the sectors. Magnetic disks don't really have this problem. They, their problems are more like, you know, they have lubrication between the different disks inside of a HDD. Uh, they, you actually stack disks when you have a HDD like that. So you can lose lubrication, you can actually lose access to data that way. Sometimes it's possible to fix it. Usually it's too hard for a normal consumer to actually fix that stuff so the drive is functionally dead. But SSDs 
tend to burn out and die and are no longer usable, they have to be replaced. And luckily in most computers, you're able to replace them. Some laptops are really hard to replace components of, but typically you can replace an SSD, just put a new one in there, load up an operating system, and you're good to go. And then we have peripheral hardware. Uh, peripherals could be anything from the monitor of a desktop computer to a keyboard, to a mouse, anything like that. Uh, peripherals can also include storage hardware. Uh, USB flash drives are actually a form of storage hardware. They use similar technology to what SSDs use, but on a much higher level. Same with like micro SD cards uh, or all that kind of stuff. Um, so peripheral devices are devices that are not core components of the computer. Uh, you don't actually need them to run as opposed to main memory or storage hardware, which you do typically need to run a computer but you can plug them in and gain some sort of extra benefit by having them plugged in. So for example, um, having a USB flash drive plugged in gives you the benefit of you have additional storage that you can move files onto. And then of course you can take that USB drive out and then plug it into a different computer and transfer the files over that way. But those are typically the four types of hardware that you'll encounter. Now, there's also a lot of different types of computers out there. And the funny thing is, is that a lot of these types of computers, these computer types are essentially marketing buzzwords. Um, because really in the end, all of them are computers, no matter what. Theoretically, they could run any operating system. Theoretically, they could you know, connect to any device all that kind of stuff, but it's usually the manufacturers that prevent you from being able to do that. And we'll get into that a little bit as I start talking about the different types of computers. Also, by the way, I want to point out that there's a lot of incorrect information in the book when it comes to some of these definitions. I've tried to give you the definitions, you know, as best as I can here, but I I personally don't think that the, the book is giving you good information when it comes to the types of computers here. The first type we'll talk about is the personal computer. Now, back in the day, um, it used to be that computers were so big and so expensive that you had to dedicate an entire room or multiple rooms to actually running a computer. So if you worked at an organization like a university or a business or something like that, and that business had a computer, what you would have to do is you would have to actually go to that computer room. You would have to get on a terminal and you would have to do whatever computations are necessary in order to complete your work. But the thing is, is that everybody would have to share that computer resource. So you have a certain amount of time allocated to you for you to actually run computations on the computer. And then it, when you run out of that time, if you haven't finished everything you need to do, oh well, try to get more time so that you can finish your work. But it was very inconvenient because a lot of people started to need computing work more and more and more in general everyday business. So when computing technology came to the point where it was actually possible to manufacture computers in a really small and cheap way. This was a huge, huge revolution because that meant that, that businesses could give all of their employees their own computers so that employees could do all the calculations they need to without needing to worry about interference from other people. It also meant that people were able to buy their own computers. So people could actually have a computer at home where they could do computing work on or play games or all kinds of stuff. It made life just much, much easier. The first personal computers were desktop computers, computers that you would sit down on your desk and then set a monitor and keyboard and stuff all that, those peripherals that you need 
right next to the computer and do your work that way. But computing technology improved and it became possible to manufacture smaller and smaller components that were still powerful enough to actually do work. And soon enough, uh, laptops started to appear, which were personal computers in a portable form factor. Now, an interesting thing is that back in the day, personal computer really just meant a computer small enough that you could have one of your own. Uh, small enough and inexpensive enough that you could have one of your own, whether that's everyone in the business has their own that they're working at, or people could own one of their own computers. And then Apple, you know, they were making personal computers at some point and then decided they were special and started trying to separate themselves from the notion of a personal computer. And their marketing, to some extent, worked well enough that we now consider PCs to be computers running Windows. But in reality, PCs used to mean any computer that you can fit on your desk as opposed to having a giant mainframe computer. A tablet is a portable computer that primarily uses a touch screen for control. And these are actually pretty old. They're surprisingly old. There are tablets out there that were built to run Windows XP and they were horrible at it. Tablets were awful for the longest time and eventually they were sort of popularized by iPads to the point where tablets are used for quite a bit of stuff now. But what I want to emphasize with tablets is that it's possible, or at least theoretically, it would be possible to run any modern operating system on a tablet. And there's a lot of communities of people who are trying to do that. Theoretically, an iPad should be able to run Windows or many flavors of Linux or even full Mac OS. But um, Apple, well, Apple started out with you know, putting iOS on tablets because the hardware was not great at the time, but they just continued to put iOS on there, even though they probably could be using Mac OS. They are intentionally severely limiting the functionality of iPads. But if you look at something like the Surface, uh, Microsoft Surface, those are able to run full Windows 10, and Microsoft even built in additional functionality into Windows 10 in order to support touchscreens really, really well. And there's even flavors of Linux out there that are getting more and more tablet support. There are, uh, there's a lot of progress in terms of writing the drivers that you need in order to make Linux run fully on tablets like Microsoft Surface or things like that. So there's a lot of possibility out there for tablets that still run full-fledged operating systems. And frankly, I'm kind of excited to see where people are able to go with it, especially where in the Linux community people are able to go with it. You also have the idea of a smartphone, which simply is a phone with a powerful computational capability. Now, smartphones didn't always have touch screens. It used to be that there were smartphones out there that were controlled with a old fashioned keyboard. I believe Blackberry at the end of that company's life was releasing smartphones that still had the keyboard. Uh, and they were trying to directly compete with the iPhone because in their mind, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't write an email with a touch screen very well. People will always need keyboards and well, look how well that turned out. But thanks to Apple, we have this idea of a smartphone being essentially a tablet with phone capabilities, but there do exist smartphones that aren't tablets, uh, that have a sort of built-in keyboard and are still able to, you know, do quite a bit of computational power. And then you have the phablet, which is essentially a marketing gimmick. Uh, it's just a smartphone that is really big. Um, so it, it happens to be a tablet because it's controlled by a touchscreen and it's a smartphone as well. Um, tablets, by the way, don't necessarily have to be big. They, uh, we have this idea that they are specifically because of things like the iPad or some of 
Samsung's tablets that are out there that were made to be really big. So then people were talking about the phablet, uh, which is a portmanteau of phone and tablet. People were talking about the phablet as essentially just being a large smartphone. Um, now, this used to be a commonly used phrase uh, because big smartphones at the time that this textbook were, was written were kind of a new thing. Um, but nowadays, you have a lot of really, really big smartphones to the point where most major smartphones are essentially phablets or what would have been considered phablets back in the day. So now we have the server, and the server definition is a little bit interesting. With a personal computer, right? A desktop, you imagine a certain form factor. It's some kind of box that doesn't have its own inbuilt screen and keyboard and stuff like that. A laptop is a box that usually unfolds, that has its own screen and keyboard and stuff built in. All of that kind of stuff. A tablet is a box with a touch screen and typically no built in keyboard because you're primarily using the touch screen in order to interact with it. Uh, all that kind of stuff. You, you get these ideas of a specific form factor with those other definitions, but that's not necessarily the case with a server. A server is a computer that is primarily used for other computers to connect to it. So other computers are going to connect to that server computer in order to access files that might be stored on it, or in order to run programs on that server computer so that you know the computers connecting to it, what are known as the client computers, don't actually have to run the program themselves. For example, you might have a really, really powerful server computer that you would connect to remotely from, say, a tablet or a low-powered laptop or something, you would run a program on that powerful server, and then you would be able to see what's happening when you actually run that program. When you have a computer connect to a server, that computer is known as a client, and the server is known as a host. Now, you might have noticed that I've very carefully worded this definition of server because I want to make it clear that any computer is theoretically capable of becoming a server. The computer that you're watching this on right now could become a server. The phone that may or may not be in your pocket, if you have a smartphone, that theoretically could become a server. Any computer has the capability of becoming a server. All you really have to do is enable connections to that computer, and ideally you would also want to install an operating system that is specifically designed to be used as a server computer operating system. Now with things like your smartphone, um, chances are, especially if you have an iPhone or something like that, chances are you wouldn't be able to turn that into a server specifically because Apple tries to lock you out from that functionality. Uh, you might notice a pattern of Apple trying to lock users out of functionality of their specific computer. It's also a big problem with them trying to lock users out from repairing their own computers, all that kind of stuff. I'm a little frustrated with Apple, I won't lie. Now there's a lot of people out there, um, myself included, who will use any computer as a server. You know, if they happen to have a computer lying around, maybe it has a few technical issues that prevents it from being used as a regular computer, but still lets it be used as a server, you can easily convert that into a server and still get use out of that computer. One example is that I have a laptop, a really, really nice laptop, where the screen is broken and it would be prohibitively expensive for me to try to get it repaired. Uh, given what I'm being paid as a lecturer, it's not something I can really afford to do right now. But rather than actually throw out that computer, my plan is to try to convert it into a server and then access data off of that server. I want to use it specifically to host 
kind of a local version of OneDrive or Google Drive or something like that so I can store data remotely and then access it across multiple computers. However, if you're actually trying to build a computer specifically to be a server, then you're going to have some hardware considerations. You're going to want a very, very powerful processor that's able to go very fast because you might have multiple computers connecting to it and all sending that processor instructions. You want that processor to be able to handle those instructions as fast as possible. Uh, depending on whether or not you're using that server for storing a large amount of data or running programs or something like that, that could dictate how much memory or how much storage you actually put onto that server computer. Ideally, you would want to use a lot of storage and a lot of main memory. People will put racks and racks and racks of hard drives inside of a server that allow it to hold you know, terabytes and terabytes of data. Uh, more on that term, terabytes, later. And then there's the idea of the server farm, which is a location that has a lot of server computers inside of it. Typically, those are going to be assembled together on racks, and they're all going to be connected with each other with just a lot of cables. There's just an obscene amount of cables, really. Um, and typically, you know, you won't actually directly access a server computer unless you are someone who's trying to maintain that server computer, some IT worker who is trying to make sure that everything is running properly. Typically, you're going to be accessing the server or server farm from a distance. You're going to do it remotely by connecting through the internet to that server farm. Now, server farms are extremely expensive. So typically, businesses are going to be owning server farms. These will be businesses that are in the business of renting out server space for other people. If you've ever, say, bought a Minecraft server, you are essentially renting out server space on some giant server farm that you are then running an instance of the Minecraft server software on it. Another example is, you know, having a server for older games like Team Fortress 2 or Quake or any of those types of games. That's all going to be typically, unless you DIY this using your own server, it's typically going to be renting out server space from some company's giant server farm. Now, companies like Google and Amazon and Facebook also have massive server farms. Typically, they're using these to keep track of the obscene amount of information that they are collecting. Uh, big data will require massive server farms. It requires huge server infrastructure that is fast and can store a lot of data and can hold a lot of usable memory. The MapReduce process requires in and of itself a lot of memory so that computers can actually work with a lot of data all at once. So, you know, companies that work with big data are going to be using massive, powerful server farms. So we talk a lot about computer data in this course, and I actually want to get a little bit into how computer data actually works. So we talked about hardware components as being electronics. They take in input data, they pass out output data, they do some sort of processing in order to create that output data, but all of this is electronic. All of this boils down to electricity passing through circuits. So how do we actually have meaningful data? How can we actually store data and information on a computer? Well, the way that we actually encode data on a computer starts with the idea of a bit. So a bit essentially represents, if you look at a very specific pathway of electricity in a computer component, a bit represents whether or not electricity happens to be passing through that pathway at 
a particular time. And if electricity is passing, we consider that to be on. And if electricity is not passing, we consider that to be off. Now the data that I have right here, you could consider as being a cross section of four wires in the computer. And we have, you know, no electricity passing through them right now. That's what the gray uh, and the zero in here is going to represent. So all of these bits right now are off. And we represent the fact that all of these bits are off by assigning a zero value to each of these bits. Now, if electricity starts passing through one of these bits, like so, we then represent that bit being on with the number one. Off, on, off, on, zero, one, zero, one. Just like that. So a bit in and of itself is the fundamental unit of information inside of a computer. It is the smallest amount of information you could possibly have inside of computer hardware, whether or not electricity is passing through something or if it is not passing through something. That zero and one is a bit. Now, because a bit has the value of zero and one, we consider a bit to be what's known as a binary digit. It's sort of like a digit that we have in our regular numbers. A digit could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. It could have all of those possible values. But a binary digit specifically only has two values, 0 and 1. So now that we've started to represent our bits as these binary digits, what people realize is we could start putting them together to represent what's known as binary numbers. Now, the way we do this is by assigning each of these bits a certain value, a certain binary value, so that when we can combine all possibilities of each of these bits being on and off, we get every single possible value here. So what I have right now is when there's a bit that is on in the ones place and all of the other bits are off, this is going to represent one. This would represent zero because we have zero ones, zero twos, zero fours, and zero eights. Now we have one, one, zero, two, zero, four, zero, eight. Then the next value is one, zero, ones, one, two, zero, fours, and zero, eights. So this represents the number two when we have off, off, on, off, zero, zero, one, zero, like that. Now for the number three, we add this bit back in here and we get one 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 two zero fours and zero eights so because of that this is going to represent two plus one equals three this is the binary value for three and so on and so forth i could do eight plus two this would be the binary value for 10. this is then the binary value of 14 and then the largest value that we can get for four bits 15. Now, the reason why we specifically choose one, two, four, and eight is because they're associated with the different powers of two. Two to the zero, which is one, two to the first, which is two, two to the second power, which is four, and two cubed, which is eight. And this might seem a little bit unintuitive at first until we compare it to the base 10 numbers that we're used to. So what I have here is a representation of the base 10 numbers right here. This is a representation of all the possible four digit base 10 numbers, sort of using the same scheme that I was using before. And I can click on here. So in the ones place, we have one, two, three, and four. Tens place, we have one and two, right? Thousands place, we could have one. So altogether, this number represents four times one, we have four ones right here, we have two tens, and we have one one thousands. 
when we add all these together, we get 1000 plus 10 plus 10 plus 4 plus 4 plus, uh, sorry, plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. That's going to be 1000 plus 20 plus 4. We get 10, 24. And we choose this 1, 10, 100, and 1000 in base 10 specifically because these are associated with these powers of 10. 10 to the zeroth power is 1, 10 to the first power is 10, 10 squared is 100, and 10 cubed is 1000. It's the same logic that I just talked about with binary digits, except now it's applied to base 10, which is what we're using right here. And if we were counting in base 12, like we might actually be doing today if it weren't for the French back in the, I forget what year, but... You know, they're the reason why we're using base 10 instead of base 12, and frankly, I'm a little salty about it. But what we would be using is digits that represent 12 to the 0th power, 12 to the 1st power, 12 to the 2nd power, and 12 to the 3rd power, and so on and so forth. That is how every single counting system works, no matter whether we're using 12, di uh, 12 digits, whether we're using 10, or whether we're using 2. So, in a very similar way to how we can encode numerical values using those base 10 digits like that, we can encode numerical values using binary digits. It's simply just a different method of counting the same numbers. You can convert base 10 numbers into base 2, and you can convert base 2 numbers into base 10. Now, this is fine if we just want to start using numbers on our computers, but we have a lot more different types of data on a computer, right? We have images, we have music, we have text, we have zip files, we have all kinds of stuff. Well, all of that is still encoded using binary digits. Uh, we just interpret those binary digits in a very specific way, depending on how we're trying to use that information. For example, when it comes to text, uh, we actually encode all of the possible letters as different binary values. And unfortunately, it's not A is 0, B is 1, C is 2, D is 3, or anything sensible like that. We actually stick them a lot further down in the list of possible numbers because we have a lot of different things that we're trying to encode in our text that aren't just letters. Uh, we also have things like symbols. We have things like what's known as the new line character. When you see that little backwards P thing in, in Microsoft Word, that's showing us that there is a new line character there. That's the actual text character that tells a program like Microsoft Word that the user has hit enter and they should start displaying all the following text on the next line of text. So we encode all of that kind of stuff as letters as well, as binary digits. And in the very basic encoding, uh, which is known as ASCII encoding, and this is not something you really have to know, but we started out using 256 possible numerical values in order to encode our text. Now it's a lot larger because we use what's known as Unicode that has support not just for English, but for all the possible different characters that any possible language would be using, as well as emoji. And Unicode gets really complicated as well because you have like specific characters that tell the um, program that it's looking at it, hey, uh, display the text right to left, or uh, make everything upside down, or join these two characters to make this character, or something like that. It gets very complicated, so you use a lot of data in order to work with Unicode. But all in all, our text is essentially encoded as numbers. Now when it comes to pictures and music and movies and all that kind of stuff, things get a lot more complicated because uh, all of that information is not encoded in a way that we as humans are really easily able to read. Essentially, we just use a whole bunch of binary numbers, and in the end, all computer data really is binary numbers. We use binary numbers to save data in such a way that whatever program is trying to open that image or play that song or something like that 
is able to interpret and then turn into an image that's displayed on your monitor or a sound that comes out of your headphones or something like that. I think music is actually a very interesting use case of this because you have all these different ways that music could be encoded, whether that is a mp3 file, a FLAC file, a WAV file, all that kind of stuff. So that all has to be interpreted by your music playing program. It's going to determine the file type of that song, and then it's going to interpret the data based on the specific way that that file type encodes musical data inside of the binary numbers. Then what it does once it's encoded everything is it's going to send electrical signals to your computer and say, hey, um, I want you to use whatever audio device um, you have, the user has selected in order to play this song through their headphones or speakers or anything like that. And then your operating system is then going to take that data, convert it into a form factor that the actual output device is able to understand. And that's going to be completely different based on what the output device is what it, how it's plugged into the computer, whether it's plugged in through, say, like an HDMI monitor that has speakers built in, or whether it's headphones connected by an aux cord, or even if it's Bluetooth, uh, it's going to send it to the correct device to that will beam all that data to your uh, output device, and then that data will control how the speakers uh, actually fluctuate in your speakers or headphones or whatever. So there's a lot of really complicated conversion between types of data here, but in the end, it all comes down to binary numbers that are interpreted by programs to be something. Now, the very funny thing is, is that you can actually trick programs into thinking that certain pieces of data are actually not the type that they actually are. And an easy way to do that is to open up, say, a text editor like notepad on windows and try to look at an image file i'll see if i can do that right now all right so i'm in notepad right now i'm trying to open a file and right now it's not showing me anything showing up in this folder because it's trying to look specifically for text documents but if i look at all files because notepad is meant to be able to look at multiple types of text documents even if they aren't just the txt type of text document you can see that I have a picture of my cat right here. And if I click it and try to open it in Notepad, you'll see all of this garbage data because Notepad is trying to interpret all of the picture data as text. And it'll take all the numbers that actually form up the picture and try to say, well, this is text, this is text, this is text, this is what this letter is, this is what this letter is, this is what this letter is. and it works fine because in the end, all computer data is numbers. So Notepad doesn't have any problem opening up a JPEG image because that JPEG image, when it comes down to it, is just all numbers. And you'll see there's a lot of garbage text here because this text all forms very valid characters, uh, text characters in terms of how we encode text. But it's garbage. It doesn't actually mean anything to us because we know that this is a picture, that it's not a text document. The computer doesn't know that. The computer is just doing exactly as I told it to, which is to open up that picture of my cat and interpret it as text. And it did that beautifully. Uh, it's very possible to do that through with other programs, through things like changing the file type of a file or something like that. And programs, if they do not have any ways of checking for this, which many modern programs do have ways of checking to make sure you're giving them valid data. If they don't, if it's a program like Notepad, which doesn't have any sort of checking functionality, then it'll do something like this and the results can be really fun. So bits themselves are relatively small and we work with a lot of data. So we would constantly be talking about things in the millions of bits or billions or trillions of bits and that's not super useful for us. So we have other sizes of data that we can really work with in order to make things more simple. We have the byte, which is 8 bits, 
Um, the byte is essentially a slightly larger kind of fundamental unit of data. Uh, one byte is used to encode a single word, or in single character, my apologies, in a piece of text. Uh, and then what we then do is increase the number of bytes. So if you're familiar with the metric system, when you have like a meter, but then a kilometer or something like that, we do something similar with our measures of bytes. So we have a kilobyte, which is 1024 bytes. We do everything in base two rather than base 10 when it comes to computers. So 1024 bytes here is actually two to the power of 10 bytes. So it's a really nice even power of two number right there. So that's why we use uh, the kilobyte, or sorry, why we use 10, 1024 bytes there. And then you have the megabyte, which is 1024 kilobytes or two to the 20th power bytes. Uh, a gigabyte is 1024 megabytes, two to the 30th bytes. A terabyte is 1,024 gigabytes, or 2,040 bytes. A petabyte is 1,024 terabytes, which is 2 to the 50th bytes. And an exabyte is 1,024 petabytes, which is 2 to the 60th bytes. Petabyte and exabyte is where you start getting into the idea of big data, and there are even measures beyond that. There's like zettabyte, yottabyte, I believe. So we have a lot of ways to measure our data here. Um, <clears throat> images and music are typically gonna be in like the kilobyte to megabyte range, depending on their quality. Uh, gigabyte range, if you have video files or something like that, if you have a very, very, very nice HD copy of a movie that you have downloaded legitimately, of course, uh, that's probably gonna be several Gigabytes. Programs might be megabyte to gigabyte range, depending on what the actual program is. Video games tend to be up in the tens, or uh, some of them are even getting to the hundreds of, hundreds of gigabytes now, which is terrifying. But that is how we measure computer data, or at least it was how we measured computer data until people who do marketing for computer companies decided that 1024 was a little bit too complicated and they changed it to 1000 per. So now a kilobyte is a thousand bytes, a megabyte is 1000 kilobytes, a gigabyte is 1000 megabytes, a terabyte is 1000 gigabytes, a petabyte is 1000 terabytes, and an exabyte is 1000 petabytes now. So you have things like a gigabyte being, um, uh, what is it, a thousand million, billion, one billion bytes instead of two to the power of 30 bytes. And it makes it easier for people to talk about it, but it also lets uh, companies shortchange us on the amount of storage that we actually get in a system because they can market it in terms of, say, you know, you have a one terabyte drive when they actually mean 1,000 gigabytes, which is actually less than what one terabyte should be, unfortunately. So that is, in my opinion, it's a bit of an unfortunate change. It does make things a little bit easier to talk about, but it also makes it possible for companies to kind of uh, shortchange us on the amount of actual storage and memory and stuff that we're getting. So now because of this change uh, from 1024 for each size to 1000, we have this weird thing where it becomes a lot harder to actually do our calculations on the computer. Base 10 for a computer is a lot harder than base two because a computer is a base two system. So what people in the more scientific side of things did is they introduced the terms kibibyte, mebibyte, gibibyte, tebibyte, pebibyte, and exbibyte, uh, which are very hard to say, but they much more accurately represent the amount of data. Say, if we're talking about one tebibyte of data instead of one terabyte of data, it's going to much more accurately represent things that are going on behind the scenes in the computer. Now, it's important for you to be familiar with some of these hardware terms because changes in hardware can lead to new 
opportunities for any organization, but also threats to current revenue generation. You have to be aware of you know, when these new opportunities come up or when there's a threat and you have to try to adapt to some kind of change, you need to be aware of what hardware is changing, how it's changing, what that change actually means, and what you should do about it in order to catch up. And these are industries that the textbook uh, identified as being, you know, new industries that kind of sprang up from changes in hardware. Internet of Things sprang up from processors getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. If you've ever heard of the Raspberry Pi, this uh, single board computer that actually lets you run a whole computing environment off of this tiny circuit board the size of a credit card, um, Internet of Things was able to take advantage of technology like that, the fact that we can get relatively powerful computers in a very small form factor. Uh, mixed reality, self-driving cars, 3D printing, cryptocurrency all took advantage of changes in hardware. These were all industries that were able to come because of these changes in hardware. So I really recommend that you read the textbook's explanations on each of these industries. With the length of this video, I don't necessarily have time to go into things in detail myself, and they do a pretty decent job talking about how the industry was evolving with changes in technology. So I recommend it. Um, I recommend you read through that. That is my discussion on hardware. Um, there's a lot in there, I know, especially, I can imagine the computer data section was quite a bit, but I really truly believe that it will be helpful for you. So I hope that you're able to get something good out of it. In the next video, we'll be talking about software.